Welcome to all of you, either watching this live or as a subsequent recording. My name is George Lewis. I'm here in my capacity as head of the School of History, Politics and International Relations to welcome you to the University of Leicester. I'm very pleased that today's event will be available in both of those live and recorded formats, as despite the ongoing pandemic, it clearly allows as wide an audience as possible to witness what is for us such an important moment. Today's professorial inaugural lecture forms one part of our university centenary celebrations, marking 100 years since the establishment of the University of Leicester as the only university to stand as a memorial to the sacrifices that were made during the First World War. The lectures of which today's event forms a part therefore also serve to showcase the world leading research and colleagues who will be leading us as we look towards our second century. Promotion to professor reflects the highest academic honour that a university can bestow on those colleagues who form such a vital part of its academic community. And our speaker today, Andrew Futter, was promoted to Professor of International Politics in 2020. Drew arrived at the University of Leicester in January 2012, having completed master's degrees at Birmingham and at King's and having taught at Birmingham and at Warwick. Now, in that time with us, his work has transformed the international understanding of nuclear politics and particularly the impact of new and emerging technologies on global nuclear order. He's held visiting appointments across the globe in places that under the current pandemic conditions we in the UK now tend to only dream about, including as a visiting fellow at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies in California, as a visiting fellow at the Center for Non-Proliferation and Arms Control in Washington, DC, at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies in Monterey, California, and a member of the Euro-Atlantic Next Generation Leaders Network. He's also a visiting fellow at the Norwegian Nobel Institute in Oslo. In that time, Drew has also published widely on nuclear weapons issues and the impact of disruptive emerging technology in work that spans seven books and dozens of peer-reviewed and prof professional articles. His most recent publication is the second edition of his Politics of Nuclear Weapons textbook with Paul Graves that came out in 2020. And many of us here, of course, know his most recent monograph, Hacking the Bomb, which came out with Georgetown in 2018, which looks in detail at the cyber threat to nuclear weapons. His work also has demonstrable impact beyond the academy, which is reflected in not only his submission to the Research Excellent Framework here in the UK, but also the extent of his grant success. Hacking the Bomb was supported by an ESRC Future Research Leader Grant and is currently working on a five year £1.5 million project funded by the European Research Council investigating the technological and political drivers of a shift towards a third nuclear age. Colleagues may therefore be thinking that Andrew's achieved so much in such a short time that he's done little outside the academic, but he has, however, also found time to become a formidable cricketer. Indeed, he recently faced up to England's Ashes bowling hero, Matthew Hoggard, and I can attest that although his batting was perhaps not quite as stylish as his writing, he did nonetheless mirror the successes of, of his academic life in staunchly and successfully defending his position. Andrew's talk today towards a third nuclear age argues that the risks associated with nuclear use and perhaps even nuclear war are higher today than they have been for at least a generation. So I'm delighted to be able to hand over now to Professor Andrew Futter. Thank you very much, George, for that um, lovely introduction. Uh, I'm glad I've faced Matthew Hoggard now when he's in his late 40s and 50s rather than when he's in his 20s, but that's very kind of you to mention that. Um, thank you quickly to everybody as well um, who've helped put this together, Abu and the team, who I know are all in the background while I'm staring at a slide, uh, making all the magic happen. So thank you to you. Uh, but particularly thank you to you, George, for, for, for two things uh, in particular. One, being the other person that has to wear one of these outfits. And luckily, I've managed to avoid um, having to wear the hat. I was sort of have to wear it, so I'm pleased about that. But more importantly, for all the support, guidance, mentorship, uh, and the confidence that you've had in me throughout my time at Leicester and your four or five years as, as head of the school, it's um, it's been absolutely essential to the things I've been able to achieve. So a big thank you um, for doing that. Um, I also would like to thank everybody who I hope um, is in the background watching this today. As I say, I'm in the rather unusual 
uh, position staring at a screen of my PowerPoint. I can't see any of your faces. I hope there are some people there um, and I hope you find this interesting and engaging. And if there are things that you'd like to talk more or find out more about them, please do or please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, a particular welcome to my mum, Alison, and my partner, Rahana, who I hope you'll still be interested in this uh, in 45, 50 minutes time. And hopefully it also means that you'll believe me when I say I don't just sit at home watching cricket. I do actually do some work and thinking at the same time as well. Um, as George says, I, I joined Leicester back in January 2012, and since that time, I've, I've been lucky to work with some fantastic colleagues who have been very supportive, given me opportunities, um, and without whom I think it would be very difficult to imagine that I would have got to, to, to where I am today. And I hope that relationship and those links that I've built with people in Leicester and, and more broadly uh, will continue as we, uh, as, as we go forward. Um, I want to use my time today to talk about the project that George mentioned and I, I hope now that the, the PowerPoint should have arrived on your on your screen um, and this is a project which is a decade or so in the making it is something that has concerned me ever since uh, I started working my PhD back at the University of Birmingham in the noughties and this is the intersection of technology and nuclear politics and the project that I'm going to speak about today and the talk I'm going to give today is is very much about how this intersection of new technologies a return of geopolitical rivalry and other things as well are transforming the nuclear risk landscape in ways that we perhaps haven't seen for a generation the project is driven by this worry or fear that we may well be sleepwalking into a much more dangerous nuclear era where the risk of nuclear weapons use becomes um, higher we have survived since 1945, at least in part to a bit of luck, um, and we should make sure that we don't just assume that we can survive uh, the next 75, 76 years um, as uh, it just uh, naturally as, as a result of that um, built up in the past. Um, so what I want to do today is talk a bit through this project, which I was very, very lucky to be funded by the European Research Council, despite our best efforts in this country and Brexit, they still decided to give me some money. So if there's anybody from the ERC, thank you very much and we'll try and spend it wisely. Um, and to introduce this project, as I say, that I've been working on for around about a year, building a team to, to look into this challenge of what we think is a, a new nuclear era, a more dangerous time that needs to be understood. So I won't I won't, won't give too, too much background. It's not a it's not obviously not a this is your life type thing, but I think a bit of context to how uh, I got to where I, where I am and, and how the ideas have developed is, is useful. So as I say, a lot of these, um, a lot of my interest or concern with the intersection of technology and politics can go all the way back to the late noughties and my PhD at the University of Birmingham, which looked at how the United States or how the interest in ballistic missile defence had evolved in the United States. Ballistic missile defence being um, the programme or range of programmes designed to shoot down adversary missiles that might be nuclear armed and therefore hopefully to defend yourself. This, this resulted in my first book many, many years ago, but also I think began uh, a real interest in deepening uh, our understanding of this connection between often non-nuclear technologies and uh, technological developments and nuclear risks. And I was lucky enough way back then to do my PhD alongside a good friend and colleague Ben Zala. Uh, and we started working on uh, this issue of what we termed then advanced conventional weapons. So weapons that weren't nuclear armed, but were clearly different from the tanks, guns and, and ships of a previous era. Something that straddled the divide and was having a potentially disruptive and maybe even dangerous uh, or risky impact on the current nuclear order. And this resulted in articles in the Non-Proliferation Review, Pacific Review, and more recently a chapter um, in a Nobel Peace Institute book uh, back in 2019. So while we were doing this, uh, and indeed links from the PhD as well, there was increased interest from a variety of different academic and non-academic stakeholders. And I've been very lucky uh, with the time that various policymakers, professionals, and those really engaged in trying to actually sort out these ideas rather than just talk and pontificate and, and write about them like me, um, to really pursue this. So, so Ben and I have continued this work and it's something, it's an idea that has continued to underpin uh, a lot of what I've done. It also links in with some other work that, that I looked at, the so-called revolution in military affairs, which was, a, um, to put very simply, the application of new types of technology to warfare, which was seen in the 1991 Gulf War. And one of the things that I tried to do was uh, try and bring this together and think about it at the strategic uh, nuclear level. So again, a book that, an edited book that I published way back in 2015, I think, um, looking at this intersection and trying to build the picture of, of what was going on. 
I, I was also, as, as George very kindly mentioned, lucky enough to secure some economic and social research council money back in 2012, 2013, to look at the intersection of what we sort of very loosely termed cyber threats and nuclear weapons. And at the time, there really wasn't very much written about this. And it struck me as a natural uh, extension of the work into BMD, into advanced conventional weaponry, to look at what we were sort of very loosely termed cyber. Everything seemed to be uh, vulnerable to cyber attacks, whether it be your own personal computer. But of course, ultimately, it led to the question of whether nuclear weapons may be vulnerable, whether nuclear weapons could be used directly or indirectly as a result of hackers breaking into systems or causing other things. So, so again, this was an extension of the idea of building up of the intellectual um, kind of profile and the intellectual uh, range of materials that, that we had to think about this challenge. And, and the book, uh, for, for, is, of course, is available now for anybody who's looking for a, a gift for a loved one, um, basically starts to conceptualise this, to think about what does the cyber threat look like? How do we think about it? Uh, and what perhaps can we do, what perhaps can we do to mitigate some of this threat as well? But it also, much as the work with Ben has done, the cyber book kind of drove me towards thinking it's not just about one technology. It's actually a lot of different things happening at the same time. It's broader dynamics that are shaping nuclear order and possibly not things that are being appreciated by policymakers or at least to the extent that they need to be. And this, of course, leads to the to, to the grant that I've been very, also been very lucky to, to, to get that George mentioned from the European Research Council and this project um, of towards a third nuclear age or the, the moniker nuclear ev. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. If you want to know a bit more about the project, um, I'm very lucky that Steph Collins and Olamide Samuel have, have worked their magic and we've got a website uh, which you can go and look at, thirdnuclearage.com. I, I don't know why I've included a hyperlink, but if you've jot it down, you can you can link to that. Um, or the Twitter handle, at Third Nuclear Age, if you want to hear what we're up to. So, given a bit of background and a bit of contextualization, but the, the, the initial research problem is, is, is quite simple, I think, in a way. How do we understand the impact of significant technological change on the global nuclear order? Now, today or the current sort of moment is not the first time that technology has had an impact on, on nuclear order. It's something that is ongoing. There are periods in the past that clearly have been disruptive as well. But there seems to be something quite different um, about what is happening now, or at least over the last decade or so, that really does need uh, recognition, really does need addressing and examining. Now, this is linked in with, with the work that I said that Ben and I had done uh, all those years ago or continue to do on, on this idea of advanced conventional weapons. So thinking about how different types of weapons technology and indeed a, a broader context, we're changing what we think we know about nuclear weapons and changing how we understand and the types of nuclear risks that we face. So we didn't really have a specific conception of what advanced conventional weapons or what this um, range of challenges included, but we believed it had a mixture of, of, of different things um, as we'll come on to of, of differing potential impact. So first of all was the emergence of non-nuclear precision strike across all domains, whether it be on land, under the sea, in space, and, and a whole host of other things as well, facilitated by enhanced sensing and tracking, underwater, from satellites, from radars, and a whole host of things otherwise. And the reason that this is interesting, or the reason that this is potentially destabilizing, is for most of the nuclear era, trying to hit a small, potentially mobile, potentially concealed target was almost certainly something that you would have to do with nuclear weapons because of the size of the blast um, and because of the, uh, of the inaccuracy of the weapons at the time. Well, once you start getting more and more accurate weapons, as is demonstrated in the 1991 Gulf War, but also in other things since, you open up the possibility of conducting some of these operations with non-nuclear weapons. And that, I think, is a significant shift from where we were before. Combined with this um, is a, uh, a real spread and acceptance and normalization of missile defense. Now, missile defense isn't a new thing. It goes right back to the 1940s. But it's changed in recent years from being a not just about the United States, but also something that is becoming more and more capable potentially against different threats and spread and normalized and not just in the Euro Atlantic, but in South Asia, in Northeast Asia, in the Middle East um, and of course NATO deployments in Europe as well. And the reason that defense is interesting is if we move towards a norm of increasing defenses, it undermines some of the logic of mutually assured destruction and deterrence that is un that has underpins nuclear order um, for generations. And I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, linking with the previous work, it was clear to clear to me that that cyber or perhaps better phrased as computer network operations or hacking was clearly an important part of this as well. We'll come back to that. But the possibility of hackers breaking into nuclear systems to cause a launch or in some other way precipitate a crisis was clearly something that we need to pay heed. 
the incorporation of artificial intelligence and the possibility of automated or autonomous weapon systems or support systems is something again that isn't new but has been given a real new lease of life in this particular era because of the possibility the amount of data you can now access but also uh, in terms of the technologies that can underpin it there are, these things are also playing out in a much changed nuclear information space so today information travels pretty much instantly you can signal quickly you can change um, what people think very, very quickly. And we've seen this in a number of different contexts um, in recent years, not least in elections and other things uh, as well. But this has implications at the nuclear level for signaling, for understanding, for uh, awareness of what's going on and the possibility of escalation. So you have these new capabilities in a context that is much quicker, probably dominated by more information and make possibly a, a context where the information is less reliable, or at least it's more difficult to ascertain what is and isn't true. Now, of course, some of this may well be uh, so some of these things are fluid and changeable. But again, it goes back to this idea. We have a number of dynamics going on at, at one time that could potentially have some pretty significant impact. But I think where some of the literature and there's some very good literature on this, but where some of it has limits is the fact that it treats things individually. And I think the key here is trying to look at this holistically, trying to look at it together, how things interact, what this means. And of course, that's where we've been lucky enough to get five years of funded time to try and think this through. So the idea here is not necessarily that everything that we think about nuclear weapons and all the frameworks and governance that we've built up in the past is wrong or defunct, um, but we do need to go back and examine it to make sure what we think we know about nuclear risk, nuclear weapons, nuclear order um, still works in, in, in an era that is very different um, from when a lot of this stuff was developed, which goes right back to the, the 1960s. So why well, should we be interested in worried? There'll be a, there'll be a number of people I, I hope in the audience that are interested in this from a, from a work perspective. There'll be some that are slightly more tangential and some um, that, that maybe are very unfamiliar with it. But I think there's a number of reasons why this is important. Now we should be interested in it's something that needs to be done. So I alluded to this earlier, but it strikes me that the challenge today is different from the past. And there are a number of reasons for this. A lot of the technologies are non-nuclear. In the past, many developments or disruptive tech were nuclear, whether it be uh, long range ballistic missiles, multiple warheads on missiles, uh, very, very quiet submarines or, a whole, or nuclear armed anti-ballistic missile systems, a whole host of, host of things. But today this is different. It's also in many ways, many of these things are non-kinetic. They are non-tangible, unlike a missile or a, a, a bomber aircraft that you can count. Um, these things are much more difficult to understand, interpret and base calculations upon. A lot of the technologies we're talking about and AI and, and cyber are a good example of, of this, are dual use and dual capable. They can be both used for nuclear or conventional uh, operations and also for military or civilian um, or have, have military or civilian applications. And what makes this particularly interesting, again, in, in difference to the past, is that these things seem to be happening at the same time, not in exactly the same pace, but all around and reaching fruition um, at, a, at a similar time and, in, and therefore impacting way beyond just one technology. And then finally, it's not just these different weapon systems, you know, the, 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 the hype about hypersonic weapons or AI notwithstanding, it's a broader context that's changing as well. A broader context in which we all live, where everything is much quicker, interlinked, uh, the Internet of Things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A second big reason why we should be worried now is the impact is global. Now, there are reasons to suggest that a focus on purely the Euro-Atlantic and the US-Russia in the Cold War in the past was slightly blinkered. But today, this is clearly a global issue. All nuclear armed states are engaged or are interested in developing new types of weaponry, some nuclear, but some uh, non-nuclear advanced as well. And many non-nuclear armed states are interested in this too. But importantly, it is no longer simply something geographically um, that is centered on largely the US, but the Cold War, but it's something that is happening in different regions across the world. And these dynamics um, are something that the project needs to look at. There are, and this probably is in, implicit in some ways from, from what I said in the first slide, but there's a significant potential impact on the central tenets of nuclear order or orthodoxy, those norms, laws, frameworks um, that basically govern our nuclear world and, and hopefully keep us safe. One of the most concerning of which is the potential for a non-nuclear first strike. So using these conventional rather than nuclear weapons to disarm an adversary, to destroy missiles before they can be fired, to destroy submarines in the case of the UK before they can be used. And this has real implications uh, and complications for 
a system that is based on mutual vulnerability. Again, this idea of MAD, which I spoke about before, but also the whole idea of the nuclear taboo, the idea that nuclear weapons are so destructive, indiscriminate and terrible that they should never be used, an idea that is that has borne up um, over the years. It's quite clear to me that we should be very careful in assuming we know or understand or think we know how crises will escalate. Um, and that they are likely due to these technologies, due to the context to escalate in different unpredictable and unintended ways. We may very quickly find ourselves in a position where one or more state thinks nuclear weapons use um, to be the only option or perhaps even um, unwittingly is pushed into this or, or, or a, a context is created where something, something happens accidentally. There are clearly also changes in the nature of proliferation. Uh, and maybe even pathways to disarmament through technological rather than political, normative, financial um, or ethical ways, something that I'll come back to slightly later in the talk. There's a compression of decision making time. Um, again, we had a recently had a president in the White House who was keen to conduct foreign policy by tweet. Well, this marks a real change from, um, albeit not quite the era of carrier pigeon when we started in the nuclear realm, but in terms of just how quickly um, and the different places that information and signaling um, can come from. Um, there's increased complexity as these different systems are, are intermingled and a blurring, I think, of this nuclear information space. And this all leads to uh, a, a feeling that the current arms control and nuclear governance structures just may not be fit for purpose uh, or at least may need to be changed or added to uh, in this new era. So this kind of reflects what I said at the start, but the, the question that this draws is, do we have the conceptual largely academic frameworks, but also the policy expertise and understanding to address this. Um, I have some concerns, and again, this is where the project comes from, that a lot of how we think about nuclear risk is overtly Western, particularly US, and there's, there's good reasons for this. The US has been one of, if not the lead player in the nuclear order and game since 1945, and definitely since 1990. Um, but also, I think that, that we've failed to sometimes look out and understand um, how things are playing out in different regions, assuming that what has happened in Cold War Europe will apply elsewhere. Much of our understanding of nuclear weapons dates back to the 1960s, um, a very different era. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it does mean that we have to look back, I think, and reassess. And much of this understanding is based on a particular reading of history. And I think we'll all agree, thankfully, a small end data set of just two um, examples of nuclear use. And this all, I think, makes it quite difficult or at least makes it somewhat problematic to rely upon or assume that what we thought of in the past will continue to work in the future of what I think and what I hope I've spelled out is, is quite a different um, uh, different context. There's some recognition of this in the literature and there's some brilliant stuff that, that this is by no means the only project looking at, at some of these issues, um, but some of them are limited in scope and I think it's probably only uh, with a five year project building a team that we can really try and look at this in the round in, in as broad a way um, as possible. So the way that we frame this and, and, and the title of the talk is about an, a third nuclear age. And, and some of you may be familiar with this, some of you not. But the idea here is that there is a there has been an academic and to some extent policy um, desire or trend to characterize nuclear history in terms of so far two nuclear ages. Um, a first nuclear age, which broadly is synonymous with the Cold War, where the focus is on the superpowers, the US, the Soviet Union, to a lesser extent, the allies of both, um, and the threat of major war between the two. Some people on this call may well uh, remember the protests and the concerns of the early 1980s. Well, this is very much what that era was about. It was about arms racing, major war, um, probably in Europe. Um, between between the two powerful two two most powerful states, there were other states that were nuclear armed during this period, as we'll come on to. But the focus and the main risk appeared to be um, on on this central balance or central axis. And accordingly, the remedy or the or the global governance um, evolved to meet this. So nuclear arms control, first in terms of limitations, then in terms of reductions, came into force. The nuclear non proliferation treaty. Um, and the establishment of the idea of mutual vulnerability um, as a centerpiece of, of nuclear order. The idea being that if you are both uh, well armed and you can't be disarmed, it's suicidal for anybody to attempt a first nuclear strike. So a certain level of balance can be achieved. Now, there is a there was a movement in the literature in this sort of the early 1990s and, a, and, a, and even in policy making circles, with, particularly with the then Clinton administration, that we may have moved into a different nuclear era. The end of the Cold War signaled a change in international politics and particularly a change in the locus of nuclear threats. We probably see this most clearly with Iraq. 
um, right at the start of the 1990s, but also include other so-called rogue or irrational actors, uh, North Korea, Iran, and, and of course, after the terrorist attacks of September the 11th, um, the idea that non-state actors may be able to uh, be, become involved in this too. So a real shift in understanding where the main threat um, to largely the US, but also to the, the system, for want of a better word, came from. There was also a very noticeable shift in terms of moving away from the Euro-Atlantic, the US-Russia, um, NATO-Russia balance towards uh, proliferation or use concerns in the region, in the Middle East, South Asia, where uh, India and Pakistan tested overtly, tested nuclear weapons overtly in 1998, um, but also in Northeast Asia as well, with the challenge um, from North Korea. Um, to, to meet this, the uh, the sort of the global architecture um, transformed as well or changed or was added to. So we didn't get rid of the stuff from the first nuclear age, but it was now complemented by nuclear security, counter proliferation, um, a means to basically stop nuclear weapons or fissile material falling into the so-called wrong hands. So a real shift from that threat of new major nuclear war to one about proliferation in the regions and maybe irrational state use and a much smaller scale. Now, We'll come on to it in a minute, but I mean, there is there, there are those that would say that this is a framework that is that is fairly artificial and there are some good reasons for that. But what it does do is allow us to consider and to frame the major risks that appear to dominate policy at any one period in our nuclear history. And now the argument that I would make um, is that somewhere around 2020, there isn't a particular day that this happened. It may not even be a particular year, but this is shifting again. So the two things that we've talked about in the first and second nuclear age haven't disappeared, but I think that they are being supplanted by a different type of threat. And this is the vulnerabilities and uncertainties created by the technologies that we've talked about uh, in the early two slides and the risk of deliberate or inadvertent use between all nuclear armed states, including the US and Russia, the US and China, but also in the regions as well. And this potentially necessitates, I think, a, uh, a new kind of era of thinking about nuclear risk management, of arms control and a whole host of other things. And just currently started some work with uh, with Ola, one of the research assistants on the project, looking at the nuclear ban treaty and how um, this kind of rejection of the formal mechanisms of global nuclear order uh, in, inherent in the ban treaty represents a change and a sea change and a recognition by some parties that risk is changing and changing in directions that may be difficult um, to meet with, with the current architecture. So, so this is the idea. This is the point that the, the technologies the changes that we are seeing are leading us into a new era and that this is where our and particularly policy making focus needs to shift to. Now I mentioned it's not the, the idea of nuclear ages is not unproblematic but there'll be certain people on this call um, who will say that it doesn't really make sense because the, cold, the the first nuclear age really wasn't all just about the Cold War because India and Pakistan already had nuclear weapons or already had a tacit capability in the 80s. Israel of course went nuclear earlier early and, um, and not to mention the UK and France. But again, it does um, allow us, I think, to look at particular conceptualizations or particular threats that, that animate policy um, and indeed public focus, I suppose, at any one particular time. The reality is that these nuclear ages are useful constructs, but they, they bleed into each other. So things don't necessarily disappear. In the third nuclear age, we will still have aspects of the first and the second. Indeed, many of the technologies that we're worried about now began development in that first nuclear age, partly as a result of technological determinism, partly as a result of, of, of offset strategies of that, of that time, came to fruition or began being developed to meet the challenges of a second nuclear age and are now causing these much bigger and um, strategic problems in a third nuclear age. So it's bleeding into one another. And I think that probably highlights this really quite well. Again, you, would, you don't necessarily have to completely agree with, with this idea of nuclear ages or, or Colin, Colin Gray or Paul Bracken, probably probably the two best books that, that look into this, um, to accept that it has some analytical utility um, and validity. It doesn't have to be perfect to allow us to understand things that are changing and to conceptualize and understand um, what's happening at the policy level as well. And I suppose the ultimate key here is, and while this idea of a third nuclear age is a, a nice kind of moniker, and I, I promise you it wasn't used just because it sounds sexy and I thought it would get funded, but it actually, it doesn't matter if you agree with it or not, it's about drawing focus to ask questions. So as we'll come on to uh, in a moment, when the team have begun putting ideas out there about this, it's not necessarily to persuade everybody, but to open open up a debate. If you think we're wrong, we think we shouldn't worry about this, then show us, tell us, tell us why that's the case. Um, so it's about starting a debate as much as anything else. And I think this is a good vehicle to use to achieve that. So 
one of the first things that well, Ben and I have been working on this for years, and and, and if you speak to him um, offhand, he'll say that we've been we've sent this to lots of different places, and and it's taken about five years to develop. But one of the first articles from the project and from this current research uh, was published earlier this year, uh, and what we wanted to do was look at or begin to make the first attempt to map out how do these strategic non-nuclear weapons, um, formerly advanced conventional weapons, we changed the changed the label slightly, um, what does that actually mean in the third nuclear age? Um, so we, we were very lucky to have this accepted and published by the European Journal um, of International Security earlier this year. And, and we made three, three main claims in this article. Again, not to try and convince everybody, but hopefully to try and drive and open up a debate um, and to get people engaged in the topic. First, we argued that nuclear ages is a useful vehicle to think about nuclear risks, um, despite its apparent historical uh, limitations. And again, it's about the focus, about where, about what worries people, about where we should um, be really engaging in terms of nuclear order. Second, that it's the interaction of technological dynamics and perceptions that are as important as any one technology or anything that's specifically deployed. This is particularly the case with perceptions because of the types of capabilities um, that we're looking at. And third, that we can potentially begin to sketch out how nuclear order may evolve uh, in terms of some different scenarios, if this development of strategic non-nuclear weapons or, or various technologies with strategic applications continues um, at the pace that it currently is. And again, our argument was that whether you agreed with all these points or not, we need to be talking about this because these are things that are real, they are happening and they are beginning to have, if not have already having, um, significant impacts on nuclear balances and nuclear security. Um, so the four possible scenarios, and, and and again, Ben and I recognise that this wasn't necessarily um, the only set of scenarios, but it was a way of getting the debate across, a way of saying, here's, here's, here's how things may unfold in the short, medium and longer term, um, and begin to think about the implications and potentially which way uh, or which option might be best or worst or, or least bad. So the first option we talked about, that if we have uh, a continued development of strategic non-nuclear weapons by all nuclear armed powers, but particularly by the major nuclear armed states. This will almost certainly lead to nuclear proliferation um, and probably arms racing in both strategic non-nuclear weapons and uh, nuclear weapons as well. The possibility that this would lead to temporary instability as states race to catch up to make sure that any potential vulnerability uh, was matched. And this could see us return to a world that looks a little bit like the 1940s and 1950s when the then US and Soviet Union raced to build a whole host of different nuclear weapons for every conceivable eventuality in order to ensure uh, deterrence and stability. And this at the moment seems to be the most likely pathway. It seems to be the one that we are probably on. A second possibility is that the development of these types of weapons by, uh, again, the major states, but probably all, leads one of these actors to having a temporary strategic advantage. So the deployment of a combination of precision strike, missile defense, cyber or whatever else um, leads, a, leads a particular state to think that they have the capability of undermining or disarming an adversary or that their adversary believes that that state has achieved it. And this creates a whole host of, of, of big problems, I think. Um, the possibility of coercion in various different ways, but also at, at the kind of the extreme end, the risk of a non-nuclear first strike capability. Now, this seems most likely at the moment to be the United States, and that's where a lot of the literature is, but there is no, but it is no mean, it is by no means a foregone conclusion that it could not be China, Russia, India, or even somebody else in the future. And um, we could well see uh, periods of temporary strategic advantage uh, within uh, within scenario one and scenario three. Um, but scenario two, I think, would be potentially the most destabilizing and worrying. So probably the most appealing scenario would be that all the states in this realm at the moment show some sort of restraint. So we may get this through new arms control, risk reduction and normative measures may well have to look different to what we relied on in the past. But it would mean that nuclear weapons would remain a central currency of international politics. It, this would not be a good scenario for the disarmers or even for the uh, nuclear reductions. Uh, people or people that believe in, in, in that as the way forward. So there would be a trade off within the restraint scenario, but it is probably from the current vantage point, the most appealing and closest to a management strategy of nuclear order, um, I think. The final one that, that, that Ben and I developed, and, and I think this is probably the most far fetched, but also the most tra potentially transformative is that we somehow get to a point in the future where the deployment of strategic non-nuclear weapons, missile defense, precision strike, etc., all of these things, creates some sort of stability. 
Um, and that actually by doing this, states come to rely more on these non-nuclear weapons than they do on nuclear weapons, therefore creating potentially the conditions for those states to disarm nuclear weapons. So this is potentially the way we get to disarmament through technology rather than those other things that I've mentioned before. Now, there are a number of very large questions about this, not least how would we get to this world, uh, how would we get to this condition without some of the things that I've talked about before, particularly one and two, but also, of course, the age old debate about whether a world without nuclear weapons would be um, would see much more conventional warfare between the great powers. There is, of course, for those of you that aren't familiar, a, a central debate in nuclear politics, whether nuclear weapons uh, induce a certain level of stability and make major war unlikely or whether the use of or the possession of nuclear weapons um, is actually so dangerous because of accidents and et cetera, et cetera. So it depends where you come down on that, but it is potentially here the most transformative scenario um, that we could move towards. A second strand and more recent strand that, that, that we've been looking at as a team is to, trying to demystify this emerging and disruptive technology moniker and, and how it interacts with nuclear risk. Now, those technologies, the ACW, SNNW, um, capabilities I mentioned at the start have broadly been labelled emerging and disruptive technology and it's not always a label that is applied um, very evenly it's often used differently by different people but it's a broader thing that there's a recognition I think that this is a, a challenge that we need to try and meet um, and, and the idea here is so, so I had some initial thoughts on this published by the EU Non-Proliferation Disarmament Court Consortium in March 2021, which was specifically aimed at some recommendations for EU or policymakers across the EU and Europe, um, and also in a forthcoming article uh, in the journal Survival. And what I wanted to do in this was sort of stand back and say, OK, we have these technologies and notwithstanding what I've just said, we really need to get past the hype and understand what is their impact? What is actually new? What should we be worried about? And what does it really mean in terms of how we change um, the methods and the mechanisms um, for keeping us safe. And what comes from this, and I'll go into it a bit more in a second, but what comes from this is that the relative newness and seriousness of hypersonic weaponry, BND, counter space, cyber, AI, uh, is actually not quite as new, or some aspects are not quite as new as, as, as is sometimes put in the debate, and that actually the key to it is really understanding the application and the politics behind it as much as any one particular technology. So I think what we've seen in this space and something the um, we're hoping in the project to um, assuage is, is a kind of worst case scenario thinking and fear of hype about, oh, we've got these new technologies, it's going to be bad, um, and actually trying to unpack it. It may well be bad, but at least let's figure out how, why, and, and in what particular ways. And again, there's this conflation uh, and worst case scenario thinking about what whatever the worst thing that could happen with any of these technologies is, um, will definitely happen, and it's not quite um, as clear as that. Again, the big thing that I wanted to put across in both of these papers, and again, this is something that reflects the work of the team, is that the destabilizing impact um, that I talked about in those scenarios is not a foregone conclusion. You can have that restraint scenario. There are ways that you can act politically, um, whether it be unilaterally as a single state or, or with others, um, that can mitigate some of these dangers. So yes, there are things going on that we should be worried about, but there are ways and there are means that we can address this. And I won't go into all of these different technologies, but I think it's useful to give a bit of an idea of the types of things that, that we looked at. So I think hypersonic weapons provides a really good example of the hype around non-nuclear tech or, or, or new technologies and disruptive technologies, but also the fact that the risks and the concerns are actually slightly different to what, to what sometimes gets reported. So whenever you see a picture of a hypersonic glide vehicle or, or, or hypersonic cruise missile, what is often said is it's the speed. Speed changes everything, and that's not really the case. I mean, ballistic missiles have travelled at hypersonic speeds for a long, long time. They are technically hypersonic weapons as well, so it's not really the speed. Another thing is the manoeuvrability. Hypersonic weapons are being developed because they can evade missile defences. They can manoeuvre uh, when in flight, either just above or just underneath uh, the atmosphere. Well, some ballistic missiles can manoeuvre as well. And of course, current cruise missiles can manoeuvre, albeit uh, at much, much slower speed. So what the point here was, is that it wasn't to say that hypersonic missile development was a good thing or we shouldn't worry about it, but that sometimes we're focusing on the wrong aspects of some of these weapons. And one of the things that struck me as being really destabilising and concerning is the fact that we won't always know what type of war Warhead, um, has been applied. So if a hypersonic missile for potentially a regional tactical mission um, is nuclear armed or non-nuclear armed and whether that 
um, and being able to understand that mission uh, by any particular adversary. Again, this is not necessarily new to hypersonic weapons, but it creates another layer of problem. So it's about focusing on the bits of these technologies that we need to worry about uh, and getting around some of the some of the hype. Um, in terms of, for example, BMD, ballistic missile defence, again, this is not new. It goes back to the 1940s. Missile defence was thought about even as far back um, as the V1 and V2 raids on London during World War II. It, it really does go right back to the birth of uh, the first cruise and ballistic missiles. But the impact is increasing. It's not necessarily increasing in the ways um, that we think. Part of the reason for this is the technologies that can be used for missile defence are changing, moving away purely from um, kinetic interception and definitely away from the older days when it was about nuclear interception, i.e. the only way you could prevent a missile uh, from hitting you was to send up your own nuclear weapon to blow it up. Well, things have changed. Things have moved on, uh, not least to an enormous range of different sensors and capabilities that can track uh, and then engage. There are many people that still suggest that missile defence doesn't work. Um, that statement, I think, is, is the wrong way to look at it. It's not Missile defence is lots of different technologies for lots of different missions against lots of different threats. Some bits are better than others is, is, is a much better way of looking at this. But what can't be ignored is the fact that these systems have become normalised, they have spread um, and increasingly have objectives in, uh, in, in different parts of the world. Um, whether it, again, Middle East, South Asia, with India deploying a, a dual layer missile defence system at the moment, China's interest, Russia uh, and, and many others besides. So again, this while it's not new, the spread, the different types of capabilities um, and its acceptance as part of nuclear order, or at least part of a strategic picture, is increasingly important. Now, the interesting, another interesting aspect here is how ballistic missile defence of the past is linking with uh, what I've termed here as cyber and left of launch. Now, the challenges associated with cyber are diverse and range all the way from hacking into the supply chain to stealing secrets, uh, right up to you know, hacking military Twitter accounts, of which there has been examples, and, and putting inflammatory or potentially dangerous tweets out. But it also includes this idea of left of launch missile defence. Now, if we consider BMD in the middle at the bottom here as right of launch, so that is you try and stop something after it has happened, left of launch is trying to prevent that thing from happening. So the policy here, and at the moment it is, there's not a lot of explicit reference to it, but it is something clearly that the United States and others are interested in, is to use capabilities such as computer network operations to prevent missiles or weapons or command and control systems from functioning properly. Um, this could potentially have been used by the US and allies against North Korea when a missile test failed several years ago. We, we don't know. Missiles are hard to build. Um, it could have been other things, but there's a good chance that that is what is happening. Now, the risk here is that by introducing new technologies or, or, or different types of technology um, of this type that you create a whole host of new problems. Whereas traditional ballistic missile defence could be counted, roughly quantified, you could see or you could estimate what radar, what a radar is able to see and track. You can look at how big an interceptor missile is and see how far, roughly how fast it could travel. Left of launch is completely different. You can't see cyber. You don't know necessarily if somebody is in your systems or whether something has been compromised. And you don't know, importantly, who this is addressed against. So development of this type of capability by India, for example, um, against, let's say, Pakistan, could easily be misinterpreted by a number of other actors as having capability against them. And the same is true for any number of other actors as well. Um, we began to look at some other technologies here that they aren't covered as much um, in the paper, not least because I still need to do a lot of reading about them and, and figure out how they how they interact. I think there's some, some very good work out there on it. But, but thinking about how some more futuristic or some slightly more tangential technologies may impact uh, nuclear risk going forward as well. Nanotechnology is something that is fascinating and the possibility of making things on a tiny scale uh, and this idea of mini nukes. Quantum sensing and computing and the use of quantum clocks, particularly for trying to find submarines. I'm not entirely sure how that works. It's something to read about or speak to somebody more, uh, more informed than I am. But again, opens up the possibility of um, being able to find previously invulnerable or very difficult to find submarines. Um, 3D printing, it's not possible as far as I'm aware to 3D print a bomb, but you can 3D print components of a weapons or proliferation, a weapons or enrichment uh, complex. Um, so that clearly opens up 
potential challenges for proliferation in a number of different ways, um, and directed energy weapons, which will, I think, have an important role across many different domains, whether it be in terms of anti-satellite or counter space, but particularly perhaps in terms of ballistic missile defence. Directed energy weapons are seen as one possibility um, of being able to shoot down hypersonic weapons um, from space. So there are a number of different things that, that we have looked at, we've considered, and we'll perhaps go into in a bit more detail going forward. But the three things that came out of this that, that are worth highlighting um, are that all of these technologies and albeit some are slightly different in their challenge to others, some may be a bit more minimal, some are less new, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but three things really stood out that, that are worth emphasizing from this work. What, the first is that there are a belief, if not the reality, that secure second strike nuclear forces could be vulnerable. Um, two particular examples here stand out. So the United Kingdom relies on very, very sophisticated, very quiet nuclear powered nuclear armed submarines um, to house its, its nuclear deterrent. These submarines go somewhere into the North Atlantic. They sit at the bottom of the ocean and they do nothing unless they have to. That's the deterrent because they can't be found. No one will attack the UK because they risk being attacked by those submarines afterwards that they can't find. Now, if you can find those submarines and you can track them, you can hold them vulnerable, then the UK has a really big problem. If somebody can not those submarines out whether it, and the UK only has four one of which is on patrol at all time but realistically it would be very difficult to have more than two um, that, that were armed at any one time then the UK has, has a seriously big problem and the UK becomes very vulnerable to those wishing to coerce um, or, or even attack the United Kingdom the same is true for mobile missiles and, and other things as well there's a question I think about how much we need to not always create new, but to reinvent or rediscover arms control. The fascinating thing about these new or kind of emerging technologies is that actually they that they kind of fit with some of the thinking that was around in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, Cameron Hunter, mem another member of the team, has been doing some stuff about this, about how we um, need to go back and look at some of the seminal works from the past. And I, and I think that's true with arms control. There are ways that we can draw upon what we talked about in the past to address some of these challenges today but it does mean thinking outside the box sometimes and it does mean opening ourselves up to things beyond purely legally binding um, formal treaties but perhaps the most important thing here and the most immediate aspect is the new types of escalation pathways that we might see now there's often a tendency to view these different types of technologies and indeed nuclear weapons in isolation um, and, and in, within their particular domain, something I often came across with my cyber work was that an assumption that a cyber attack had to be met by a response cyber attack. Well, it's just, just not true, is it? If you um, if you send an aircraft to bomb a target, it doesn't mean you have to send an aircraft to bomb something in retaliation. You use whichever levers you have. Well, the fact that one of the things that really comes out of this is the interaction and the commingling of all of these different technologies create different ways that the that, that crises could escalate. And again, we could find ourselves in a position where nuclear use is being contemplated or has been pressured or has been mistakenly arrived at because of these pathways that we hadn't thought about. They may work, they may well be similar to the past, but we need to go back, I think, or at least think about whether they do remain true today. Where we are currently at the moment with the project is beginning to think slightly more broadly. So what I've talked about so far is, is a lot of technology. Uh, and technology, technological change in the context is clearly at the heart of this third nuclear age challenge. But one of the things that's become clear is that we can't um, disassociate this or we can't distance this from the political, geopolitical and great power framework and indeed some much broader frameworks within which um, the current uh, phenomenon is, is unfolding. So what, what we're trying to do on the project at the moment is, is think beyond technology and, and what other types of and factors or dynamics do we need to include um, when we're thinking about this third nuclear age? So first of all, and this is again some work that I'm, that, that I'm doing with Ben, I'm, I'm very lucky that Ben has all these really good ideas which I can nick and then put them on my slides, but the idea of great power politics and polarity. So the fact that these technologies are not occurring or the development of these technologies are not occurring in a vacuum. They are occurring at the same time as we're seeing a move towards genuine multi-nuclear polarity with the US, Russia, China, and we would argue India as well. Um, and a real shift, I think, from the era or the generation of US unipolarity. So this technological change is playing out and is co-constituted with and of this great power nuclear competition and a return to nuclear posturing and the apparent um, the importance placed on nuclear weapons within um, within national security strategies and policies. And you could even include the recent UK announcements in the integrated review um, as possibility of this, of linking great power status or global Britain um, with an increase in the nuclear stockpile. 
A second aspect, um, which again, I'm grateful to, to the team for introducing to this, is, is the importance of techno politics and technological determinism and moving away from the idea that these technologies exist in a vacuum. Um, again, it's this idea that um, this is not a foregone conclusion. We don't necessarily have to sleepwalk into a more dangerous world, but that actually these are politically and socially constructed things. And very grateful, a fantastic book on this that some of you may have read called Inventing Accuracy by Donald McKenzie, which talks specifically about how US nuclear warheads evolved or the technologies and the deployments evolved as much as a result of institutional politics and a whole host of other things as it was anything to do with particular targets. And I think that's quite an important, shines an important light on this third nuclear age challenge about how we understand and conceptualize technology and adds another layer um, to that great power competition as well. I mentioned this right at the start, I think in the opening slide, but there's a real concern that the third nuclear age may be a, a, a time period or a, uh, an era that is dominated by a lack or apathy in terms of elite and public interest engagement with nuclear risks. Compared with the 1980s when people really were exercised about nuclear risks, not least in this country, uh, and the deployment of, of, of US missiles uh, and a ramping up possibly of the arms race. Well, today there's very little interest, it seems, in, in nuclear threats and nuclear risks. And, and that's something that I suppose has driven me a little bit in my academic career generally, but also I think in this new nuclear age, a, a belief that while there are some fabulous people in government working around these issues, that the understanding, the appreciation, um, and maybe even engagement with them is not as deep as it needs to be. So part of this project and part of this third nuclear age idea, and there's some, some work I know ongoing uh, by other colleagues on this, is to try and make sure people are re-engaged. Whatever they decide is the best way forward to make sure they are in a position that is informed to make those decisions. This, um, it leads in, uh, and again, I've included hyperlinks, I'm not, not entirely sure why, but, but it, um, it leads in with some other work that, that, that I've been doing uh, with various colleagues, looking at how most recently the COVID crisis, but also over a longer period, climate change has really captured our imagination as a society as an existential risk to the detriment of nuclear weapons. And of course, that may well be entirely understandable in terms of COVID and um, where we are at the moment, but I think we must be careful not to forget about the importance of these risks uh, when it comes to um, understanding faith and making the world we're in more peaceable. A, a final aspect, and I'm not entirely sure whether this fits with the third nuclear age or not, but is definitely part of our understanding and very, very grateful to uh, my friend Benoit for um, kind of introducing this and writing some excellent stuff on it, but is to go back and think about how we've constructed the nuclear world we're in. So how have we understood things of the past, whether it be the Cuban Missile Crisis, what lessons have we drawn and how has that shaped how we think about the future and what the different possibilities are. And I think there's a really good case here that the third nuclear age needs to be one where we are open minded and we don't feel constrained or as, uh, as Benoit puts it, we, we are not self-censored in terms of how we think about mitigating risks and all the things that, that, that come with it. I hope, hope that's a good plug for your uh, nuclear knowledge work, Benoit, if, 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 you're, if you're on the call. So I'm uh, drawing to a close now, I think. Um, it's worth just this this project is still ongoing there is there is much to do um with, with the team and i are um just about to start really engaging interviewing people across the world about this to build up a much bigger picture but i think we can already see that there are a number of implications for theory and practice or at least to open up a debate in this third nuclear age so first of all nuclear risks are the product of politics geopolitics technology and norms technology seems to be the main driver at the moment but the more we look at this problem set the more it becomes clear that it's something far more complex and that politics ultimately remains the key variable that we need to look at we need to be very careful that we that we don't assume what we think worked in the past will work in the future going back looking at what's happened in the past what lessons we learned what lessons we didn't learn what lessons we could have learned and how that apply how that applies um, to our nuclear future. Again, it's this idea of we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that luck has probably played a fairly decent amount, uh, a fairly decent role in our past, um, and our luck may not hold out forever. I need to reimagine uh, nuclear arms control, nuclear governments and, and, and disarmament, again, going back to some extent to those seminal texts that, that, that I mentioned, but also encouraging ideas outside the box from people, you know, different ways. It may not look like the current arms control we have or have had in the past, but that's okay. The key is, the key is mitigating risks, not replicating what we already have. There needs to be a recognition of the diversification of actors involved in global nuclear order. 
Um, this is not a Euro Atlantic problem. This is something that affects everybody. And I know Ola, a member of my team, is currently looking at, at the role of Africa in the global nuclear order, a story that really hasn't been told, and we're hoping that, that he will tell. Um, but thinking about this globally, think about it in terms of the experiences in different parts of the world, not just in a kind of Western centric dominated way. We also must think about the different actors involved now in another way, in terms of IT companies, whether it be Google or Facebook and a whole host of other things, and the role that they may play, particularly in the computer network operations stroke AI automation fields as well. The nuclear non-nuclear distinction is becoming blurred in a way that just I don't think has ever been the case in the past. Conventional weapon systems have always been important and always played a role and the balance has always been there but this new set of weapons or capabilities and dynamics that, we've, that, that I've talked about today really do blur that in a way that is different to the past and I think that's important to recognise. We need to focus on pathways to nuclear use and risk reduction rather than focus on weapons or domains, something that I talked about a bit in the past. It is about finding things that we really don't want to happen and working backwards rather than counting bombers um, as we had in the past, although that may still have a role to play in some aspects. Three things which are going in the wrong direction, but which, which we need to address. How do we build in time? How do we facilitate dialogue? How do we increase transparency? All of those, I think, are part of any solution or any mitigation, mitigation strategy um, for the current nuclear risk that we face. Perceptions matter as, as much, if not more, than capabilities and realities. So you can look at the different weapons that, that states may or may not build. In a sense, it doesn't really matter. What's important is what your adversary or what your competitors or other states think you're doing or think you might be doing. And this is no clear aspect, no clear example of this than in the cyber realm. This, of course, isn't new. People have been writing about the importance of, the importance of perceptions for, for years, but it is, a, it is a key thing to reiterate as part of this. Um, the centrality of nuclear education and raising awareness, uh, that's something that I hope that my work and colleagues work at, at Leicester and, and further afield have been doing for, for a number of times. It's one of the things that drives me to, to do this is to get people to understand, engage and at least have the building blocks to make decisions, whatever those decisions are. Um, but also I think it's important at policymaker levels as well to make sure those that are making decisions, engaging and thinking about uh, the stuff at the absolute highest level are aware of the risks, are aware of the implications, are aware of the sort of things that we've talked about today. And then finally, it's about encouraging unconventional approaches to nuclear problems. Um, and one of the things that I'm always, uh, always kind of fascinated by is when I introduce um, my in, in my third year nuclear weapons module, when I introduce some of these questions or some of these problems or some of these dangers, some of the things that students say are really quite different to what we currently have, or, or there's a lot more already cut through some of the political um, and historical ob obfuscation and come up with quite nice ideas. You know, what, why, you know what, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? And I think that's really, really important that we encourage people to come at this from different angles, with different ways, um, potentially to make different solutions as we go forward. So just some concluding thoughts, and I, I hope, hope I've not taken up too much time, but we're moving, or at least I hope I, I, I've put across or, or, or tried to convince you that we're moving into a more dangerous and uncertain period in our nuclear history. Um, and I think there's at least a chance or a concern that we don't have either the academic toolkit or the level understanding in the policy world to minimise the new types of risks that we might face. The chance of nuclear use may well be rising rather than falling. There's no real way of, of measuring this other than um, the, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, how, close, how close we are to midnight. Um, and again, just to remember that we've probably been lucky as much as anything else to survive the first 76 years of living with nuclear weapons. Um, and we would need that luck or hopefully, or we need something in addition to luck, I think, to survive the next. This challenge that began with all that, with that work that I did in my PhD and stuff that Ben and I used to talk about over a beer or a coffee back in Birmingham, um, it strikes me this is more than a technological challenge. Um, and there are different co-constitutive layers to it. Um, yeah, for sure, there are many pressures that are happening at the same time, those weapon systems, the, the broader context that's shifting, but we shouldn't um, abstract this from the politics and from the way we think about nuclear risks um, within which it kind of encompasses. and maybe even think about concentric circles in terms of understanding the problem. There is a risk, of course, that by expanding this concept of a third nuclear age to include how we think about risk, future scenarios, et cetera, et cetera, um, that it becomes so broad it's meaningless, but I think that's one of the nice things of doing a project like this is that we have the time and the scope um, to do it. 
Finally, um, the main aim of this project is not necessarily to convince you uh, or convince other people of our arguments, but it's to begin a debate to make sure we are engaging with what are probably different and maybe new and worrying challenges of, of a new era. And the longer term, the hope is to build intellectual capacity globally, and there's some fabulous people working on these topics um, across the world at the moment, but to begin to put together an epistemic community of people to try and respond to this. And this is something I hope to do uh, in the years ahead, not just on this project, but even further ahead than that. Um, and with that, um, I will finish off uh, just to say again, thank you very much for listening. I hope some people uh, are, are, are still awake. Um, if you do, if you are still awake and you've got questions or um, you'd like to find out more, there is the website, and, but please also feel free to send me an email uh, and get in touch. And with that, I will hand back to George. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Were it not the pandemic, we would all be applauding loudly now and then raising a, a glass at a reception. Uh, while I would ask all of you to join me in a virtual round of applause, uh, I will leave it up to you to decide whether or not to raise a glass to, uh, to Drew over your own uh, lunch. Thank you all very much for coming along today. Congratulations uh, once again to Drew on both his talk here and also his promotion more broadly. Uh, and I will now draw this event to a close.